Hello, my name is Jennifer Marsman, and the crazy contraption you see me wearing on my head is a headset that reads EEG, and it's made not by Microsoft. I work for Microsoft. Uh, this is made by a company called Emotive. It is a female-founded startup, woohoo! And uh, uh, it's, they have uh, offices in San Francisco and um, Hong Kong, I believe. Uh, so I have this headset, and what it does is it reads EEG, or your brain waves. And so I took this headset, and I put it on my husband, and I asked him a series of questions. And first, I had him tell me the truth, and then I asked him to lie to me. And what that gave me is a labeled data set of what his brain waves look like when he's telling the truth, and what they look like when he's lying. And so I was able to feed that data into a machine learning algorithm and build a classifier to perform lie detection. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, if you do have any questions or things that don't get answered, I am on uh, various social media. I have a blog and Twitter and a million other things, so I'm pretty, pretty easy to find uh, online. So feel free to follow up um, if there's anything that doesn't get answered today. All right, so let's kind of start with the basics. What is EEG? So essentially, um, EEG is just a non-invasive way of, of I, there's little um, felt pads that are resting against my scalp right now, and it's a non-invasive way of measuring uh, that, those electrochemical signals um, that are running through your brain. And uh, for the official uh, definition, we can turn to, of course, the source of all knowledge, which is Wikipedia, right? Uh, so Wikipedia has a little blurb right there that I threw up there about uh, um, exactly how, how these, these signals work. Um, what, what happens, for those of you who came early and saw me setting up, uh, the way this works, there are actually um, 16 different sensors that are resting against my scalp here. And it's a wet sensor, so I did, it's, it's a little felt pad, and I actually use saline solution, like the same thing I use for my contact lenses, um, to wet each, um, each of the little pads individually, and then you screw them all on. Um, and it's a little bit of a, a process, um, especially when you have hair. <laughs> so it's really funny. Every single demo that like, the emotive company has done publicly, they always use a bald guy, like always, because bald guys is just easy. You just stick them on it, and it works, and bam. With me, it's like this 20-minute-long process of like putting it on and adjusting chunks of hair around and that sort of thing to get a good signal Reading. So a little bit, a little bit more uh, complicated. Um, the last point I want to make is that um, I think everyone in this room probably knows this, um, but just in case, I, I remember I submitted once to a, a conference, and I, I used to call this talk "Fun with Mind Reading." Um, and someone, like it was one of those conferences where you could see the feedback if your talk wasn't accepted. And so someone wrote something like, this is not mind reading. And I was like, yeah, actually, I know. Like, the abstract actually said it wasn't. It was, um, it was just a fun title, you know. But uh, so let me be really, really clear. This is not mind reading. If I were to put this uh, headset on your head, I cannot tell what you're thinking. Uh, but what I can do is I can create mappings between series of brain waves, EEG, and actions. And those could be actions in the physical world. So for example, there's some cool stuff you can do with like using um, your brain to like make a drone fly and things like that. And then also um, the actions in the, um, in the virtual world. So I'm gonna attempt to do that in just a second, you will see. And then secondly, um, I can see patterns in the data, or more accurately, um, I can train a model to see uh, patterns in the data and then use machine learning to make predictions based on historical data. So if I have, you know, if I see a series of uh, brain waves that means, indicates that someone has been lying in the past and see that same pattern again, then that can indicate that, oh, okay, um, you're lying to me. So those are the things that, uh, that we're gonna do here today. So let me just start by showing you kind of what got me so excited about this headset. So I actually first learned um, about this headset um, way back in ancient times of 2010. Um, I saw a TED talk by a woman by the name of Tan Lee, who is the, the founder of Emotive. And if you guys get a chance, it's only like 
10 minutes long, super quick, and it's just an amazing thing. I'm gonna show you a tiny excerpt from it um, today, but go back and watch the whole thing because it's, it's really cool. Um, but I saw this headset and I saw some of the power of what it could do in that TED Talk, and I was like, I want that. And so I had been just craving it ever since, and then um, finally uh, finally got a chance to get one and, and was uh, been so excited and have uh, just a million fun experiments planned. Um, to do with this. So let me, but let me show you some of the things that got me so excited. So I'm going to open, um, this is a piece of software that came, it's made by Emotive, so it, it came with the headset. And um, it's called the, the control panel. So let me do this so that way you're not seeing all the background stuff. Okay. So right now when I first put it on, for those of you who came early, and kudos by the way, since this is the first session of the day, the, the day after the attendee party, so that's always a, a rough session to get to. Um, so, but for those of you who got early, you saw me going through the process of putting this alien solution on the pads and screwing uh, each one in and getting everything situated. And what this gives you, this little diagram, is a, a heads down diagram of the, um, of the actual, of, of my head, and this is my nose and my ears, and it's showing that all the sensors are reading green right now, which means we're getting good signal strength, which is good. Um, and so there's a couple different things, so we're, we're good on that, so let me jump over here and show you something. So this is showing that it's not only uh, using my, um, my, my brain waves, but facial expressions actually get picked up in EEG, so facial movements. So if I blink, blink this eye, Blink the other eye. Um, if I look one way, look the other way. Is it picking it up? I can't see because I'm looking. <laughs> um, smiling, which is almost thing. You can raise your eyebrows. Woo! So um, it's kind of cool that it actually can do that as well. So there is a developer SDK, so you can tap into these. These are essentially events that are fired of, of movements of the face, and so you can wire things to those events as well based on expressions. Um, but what I want to show you, what I, what, what this was the thing that really made me think, oh my gosh, I have to have this device, was, was this particular demo right here. So what I am going to do right now is I am going to move a cube with my mind. All right, I'm going to go all Jean Grey on you. And so the way we do this, this isn't even machine learning. What this is doing is just very simple pattern matching. All right, so I am going to first start by training a neutral state. So I'm going to kind of go to my happy place for uh, eight seconds. It takes eight seconds to train. So I'm going to try to be completely relaxed with a group of people staring at me um, for eight seconds. And then um, that'll give it a sense for um, what my brain looks like at rest. Because um, each person's brain has kind of a unique like fingerprint. They all have their own signature. So like, for example, my brain might spike at 24, and my husband's brain might spike at like three. So um, you might have to account for these things uh, when you're doing your various uh, tests. So I'm going to uh, start with that. So I'm gonna, there's going to be a really awkward silence, but we're all going to be okay with it. And I am going to close my eyes for the eight seconds because it's really weird having a bunch of people staring at you. So when the um, eight seconds is done, will somebody just scream something out loud that, hey, you can open your eyes now. Okay. So eight seconds, uncomfortable silence. Here we go. No? Okay. Is that this training? I'm actually going to do it one more time because I was a little bit distracted. Let me train one more time. Sorry. No. Thank you. All right. So, yes, I'm going to accept that one. I was a little more focused there, or a little bit more relaxed there. Okay. So now what I'm going to do, there's actually a different series of actions you can do, and I'm going to map this to the, the pull action, because that's a neat visual of the cube coming towards you. So now what I'm going to do is for eight seconds, I'm actually going to think with my mind, pull, pull. And, I, and of course, I don't actually have to be thinking pull. I could be thinking hamster dance or whatever I want to, as long as I consistently think that thought pattern whenever I want to pull the cube towards me, it should work. All right? It's just, this is just pattern matching. It's not even machine learning here. So um, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do pull. I'm going to think pull with my mind um, uh, for the eight seconds straight, and then, uh, and then we'll see if it works. So here we go. Training again, eight seconds, envisioning, pull. Here we go. Oh, 
Okay. All right, now, once I hit yes, the cube is gonna be live, and then I'm gonna try to essentially duplicate that thought pattern and then pull the cube towards me. So here we go. Yes. All right, now, pull. I just moved the cube with my mind! Is that not cool? Let's do it again. Here we go. Right, right, come, oh, come on. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. All right, so pretty, pretty cool stuff. So you can see how I did this. Uh, I, I, saw, I first saw the talk when they were demonstrating this and I was like, okay, I, I need that because you haven't really lived until you've moved a cube with your mind. Um, so it, it was, it's really exciting. So I had all these ideas um, and then I, I had finally, after like wanting this thing for forever, I finally got it and I was just so excited to try these things and of course get access to um, all of this fun data um, to be able to do some really fun stuff with machine learning. All right, so before we jump into what I did though, let me just show you one more thing, which is this is just a quick snippet of the TED Talk. Um, it's a really short uh, version of it, but I just want to show you one part where they demonstrate some of the applications and what some people are actually doing with this technology. So I'd like to show you a few examples because there are many possible applications for this new interface. In games and virtual worlds, for example, your facial expressions can naturally and intuitively be used to control an avatar or virtual character. Obviously, you can experience the fantasy of magic and control the world with your mind. And also, colors, lighting, sound and effects can dynamically respond to your emotional state to heighten the experience that you're having in real time. And moving on to some applications developed by developers and researchers around the world. Uh, with robots and simple machines, for example, uh, in this case, flying a toy helicopter simply by thinking lift with your mind. The technology can also be applied to real world applications. In this example, a smart home. You know, from the user interface of the control system to uh, opening curtains or closing curtains. I like how he always has to do the hand gesture. These are not the droids you're looking for. Do you see he always does the hand with it? Yeah, see? Turning them on. He cracks me up. Or off. This one's my favorite. And finally, to real life changing applications, such as being able to control an electric wheelchair. Uh, in this example, uh, facial expressions are mapped to the movement command. Now blink right to go right. Left, turn back left. Now smile to go straight. We are really All right. All right, I'll cut it off there. But, um, so really cool stuff, right? Like, there's obviously huge potential for things like gaming. Um, just to create um, a, a feedback loop where you could, you could actually have the game uh, be based on the person's emotional state. So imagine like being able to tell that someone's starting to get a little bored and make another zombie jump out. You know, just using that kind of real-time feedback loop based on a person's real emotions and being able to cater the game to them is, is kind of a neat, a neat idea. And then, of course, the smart home stuff is, is, is interesting as well. Um, but the one that really got me is, is the case at the end. Um, a, a paraplegic or someone paralyzed from the neck down being able to um, have that freedom of mobility again by using facial expressions and the, the power of their thoughts. So really, really cool, you know, life-changing stuff that, you know, is, is, there's neat potential here. All right, so there's all these amazing, like, world-changing type things that we're talking about. Then what does Jennifer choose to use this technology for? Lie detection, <laughs> right? Very, very, um, very, uh, way to change the world, Jennifer. Um, and so, so here's how I got started with all of this. Um, I started thinking about um, polygraphs. And so if you've, if you've done any reading on the topic, uh, there's a lot of critics of the typical methods of, of doing polygraphs. Um, that a lot of times that they say that they're based on the st uh, how emotional someone is rather than whether they're truly innocent or, or guilty or telling the truth or, or lying. 
Um, and they do measure things like, you know, your, your heart rate, um, your galvanic skin response, like how sweaty you get, um, your breathing, like all of those things. And um, if you've seen the same uh, kind of cop shows that I have, um, you'll know that there are ways that you can, you know, beat some of these things because uh, having a high stress rate or high emotional rate can also be... Um, can be uh, simulated by pain. So you can, you know, this little trick of like putting a tack in your shoe or something. And, you know, when you're telling the truth, you step on the tack so that your emotional state is like this. And then when you're lying, it'll stay high emotional rate. So it looks somewhat consistent on whether you're telling the truth or lying or just truly believing, getting yourself into a mental state where you really believe the lie and, and things like that. So there's, there's ways of, of beating these. And so I started thinking about... Um, so I'm not a neuroscientist by any, I took like one class on like um, the brain in college. Um, and at the time, um, I, I, I remember, the, one of the things I remember from that is that when you're telling the truth, that typically activates um, the recall centers in your brain. And when you lie, that typically activates the creative centers in your brain. And I started thinking, okay, if it's activating these different places on my brain and I have this headset that's reading from 16 different places, then might I be able to tell? And, and I didn't know if this was gonna work or not. I just kind of had an idea and said, okay, let me just try this and see what happens. Um, and that's kind of how, how this all got started. Um, so the, I kind of listed out my goals and my tools in good little former grad student fashion. Um, but so the, the end goal was to see, okay, can I use this data to accurately predict if someone is lying? And then I have my tools all, all listed out there too. All right, so here's the actual procedure. Um, my, my poor sainted husband, um, Eric, um, I had him sit in a chair. I did have him um, relax and, and close his eyes, and I, that was for two reasons. Um, number one, I actually was sitting next to him um, I, on the first round. I think he was across from me on the second round. But I think he was next to me on the first round and um, because I was still keeping the headset pretty close to the reader. This is actually using not Bluetooth, but a similar kind of like proprietary wireless technology to communicate from here to here, so you can't be too far away from the machine. Um, and so I was just you know, playing it safe then. Uh, I hadn't learned all the limits yet. And um, so I sat and asked him these series of questions, and then I was you know, sending markers as he started talking and, and that to kind of annotate my data, because I have all this brainwave data, but I wanted to actually annotate, okay, here's where I asked the question, here's when he was answering, those sort of things. And so there's a way to annotate it and uh, manually do things. And I'll actually show you some of this too. Um, and I, I did ask him to sit relaxed in the chair for two different reasons. Um, number or have his eyes closed for two different reasons. Um, number one was that so that he actually wouldn't make like crazy facial movements. And I'll show you. You remember with the um, so this is this is the test bench tool. Um, remember how when I was telling you that the. Um, uh, the, it was picking up the facial movement, so I was looking one way or the other way, and it was sh reflecting that in the data. So this is, oh, I'm thinking, look at my, look at all that activity. Um, and so here is where, I wonder if that correlates to where I say, um, and I'm actively searching for a word in my mind. That's interesting. Okay, sorry. Um, all right, so here is, oh, look at, look at all that thinking happening right there. All right, so here's, um, here's what, <laughs> No, I'm just laughing. So when you, here, let me just try to go still for a second. So if I close my eyes and I just relax a little bit, you'll see that it goes a little bit more um, sol or just flat line. Yes, yes, okay, boring waves. And then notice if I do this with my face, or oh, big scratching, lots of facial movement. See all the noise that puts in my data? I'm trying not to think anything, so that way you'll see. Just with facial movement. There's so many stupid pictures of me on Twitter. <laughs> okay, so um, you can see facial movement does actually affect this data a lot. And so first reason I had him close his eyes and, and relax his face and all that was because I didn't want any facial movement to mess up my data. I was trying to keep it as, as clean as possible for this con, you know, controlled experiment. So I had him keep his, you know, no scratching your face, no touching, just keep your eyes closed, re face relaxed, and answer the questions. Was the, was the deal. And then the second reason was, since he was sitting right next to me, I didn't want, um, 
I didn't want him reading the questions over my shoulder, right? Because if he was reading the questions over my shoulder, then he might actually be thinking about the answers at a different time than when I was annotating the data, because I would read him the question out loud and then hit a marker in the data so that I could, I was trying to pinpoint in all of this brain data, here's exactly when he was thinking about it, or at least a smaller region so I could pull out a smaller subset rather than using all of the data, right? And so if he was reading over my shoulder, then he would start thinking early and I wouldn't get that the right data pulled out. So those were the two reasons. All right, and this is the tool I use. This is the, um, the test bench uh, suite that also came with um, the Emotive uh, software. So this is another piece of software they made. And it shows um, the brainwaves from all of, these, um, all of these channels. And you can see I can actually turn channels off if I don't want to look at all of them. I can deselect some. But right now it's reading from all of these different, uh, all these different channels. You can see this went orange, which means it's not reading quite as well right now. Um, so here's all my data. And so what I did was I was asking those questions, and then as I asked the question, there's this markers that you can send manually. And so I had some markers here in documents, emotive. Yeah, let's take the data two ones. I think we're a little better. All right, so I had a couple different things that I would ask. And then as I send a marker in here, so as this data is, is rolling in from each of the sensors, um, I can send a, like for example, I just asked a question, I can hit a one and send a one. And it will, um, it actually shows you the one here along the bottom um, as you're scrolling. And if when you answer the question, I can put in a two and then grab everything between one and two, for example. So it gave me a way of extracting some of the data from all of that mess because um, it's a lot of data. All right, so that allowed me to narrow in on the times when his, his brain was actually doing the processing. All right, the other thing I should say is that the, the sampling rate here you see is 128. That means it's taking 128 readings per second, which works out to roughly every eight milliseconds it's taking a reading. So just in case you're wondering. Wow, look at all this. That's kind of cool. Um, all right. So here, I'm going to turn this off because I get way too distracted when looking at my brain waves. All right. So I asked him. I was running that test bench. I was sending those markers like you saw. Oh, actually, let me show you the data that comes out of there, too. So this data is actually, the data that comes in here is actually, um, so it's all stored in a proprietary format. And then that proprietary format has a, a convert to CSV, essentially. So it goes on disk in one format. Then you can run this, this uh, command line tool to convert it into CSV and, and look at that. So um, actually, I'll, let me just show you. Yeah, I can go ahead and just show you this. But the, um, the, so basically, I asked him a bunch of yes or no questions is the thing. And then here is an example of some data. And let me zoom in so you guys can see this OK. All right. So this is all the data that, that comes. Can you guys read that OK? Is that easily visible? All right, great. Um, so here's all the data that comes with TestBench. And then I added some of my own columns on the end as well. So first of all, um, there's a counter column. This just counts up to 128 and resets. Um, for the, the sampling rate, so I ignore this. I ignore this. Here are the actual interesting columns. So the, this is the data, um, and, and kind of note these headings. They have funny names like AF3, F7, F3. I'm going to show you where those actually correlate to the places on my brain in just a second. But there's, here's all of our different channels right here of data. So we have all these different uh, channels coming in. Um, and so you can see the data is mainly in like the, the 4,000s, roughly. So we have all this data coming in from different areas. And then um, we also have, um, there's a, a gyroscope here. So there's x, y values. I am not currently using this data, but it might be interesting to, to play with. I've, I've thought about uh, adding it in just to see what it would do if it, there was any correlations. Um, and what I was thinking about is like the World Series of Poker. You know how sometimes people have their tells about, you know, if you, you know, there's tilt their head a certain way or behave a certain way when they're lying. Um, so there may, be a, there may be some correlation in there, but I haven't been using it yet. Um, this is the marker column, this next one. So when I do send in those ones and those twos and such to, to slice out the relevant data, I, um, the markers will show up here. So it shows zero by default, and then the, the other numbers that I defined what they are, and then send those in to be able to slice out um, relevant chunks of data. 
um, those would appear here. So then I would just grab everything between like a one and a two, for example, and extract that data out. And then I could do some neat stuff with it. Um, the other thing, they provide um, time values in, as two separate columns. So there's a time value second and a time value um, in milliseconds right here. And so I actually do some processing on the back end to convert that into a single value so it's easier to do math with it. So just take you know, the seconds times 1,000 plus the milliseconds to get the entire value as one number. And then um, for each of these, you'll see there's also another whole set of uh, uh, additional data, and it's the CQ underscore those same names. And what that is is the contact quality. So you noticed how there were, um, you know, the green, those green things, and I was saying, oh, great, everything is reading wonderfully. Um, there's actually an enumeration for that um, where it's, it's various colors it shows up in the UI, and then there's numbers here in the actual data. Um, but it's a, a value between zero and four for how strong the signal quality is. And so and it reads for each individual one. And so that's really nice for doing your data cleaning. Um, when I see these values coming in, if I see you know, a bunch of zeros right here, like I threw all this data out actually when I was doing my processing, because this is when you first put it on the head, it doesn't start reading all of them instantaneously. And so you can see these are zeros for a bit, and then they all turn to fours after a while, okay? And then that's when I actually start my reading. Um, so that's the contact quality for each of the channels that are touching my head. And then here, so that's where the emotive, um, or the, uh, the stuff that the emotive software, the test bench software, provides ends. So these three columns at the end were things that I created. First, I needed a label column. So this is the value that I wanted to predict. Um, and so in this case, this particular file was user 20's data, and it was, this was all them answering truthfully. So for the, I created an is truth column and set this one to one. Um, this is my time data where I just converted it into a single value in milliseconds rather than having the seconds and milliseconds as two separate columns. And then finally, I have a user ID. So I started this work with my husband, and then I kind of expanded it after that and started putting the, um, the headset on lots of different people and then trying to extrapolate to be able to do you know, general purpose lie detection would be the next um, exciting challenge. All right, so that's kind of what the data looks like and, and what, what we have access to. Now let me jump back here. So, um, so I asked him a series of questions. These are the initial questions I asked, so it's not, um, I, I asked them all multiple times. And the reason for that, I actually read in, in some of the literature and some of the stuff that uh, Emotive said or sent out that it's actually good to do, and, and some of the research I was doing on EEG, just reading things randomly online, that EEG is inherently such noisy data because so many things, you know, from your facial movement and, um, you know, there's a lot of processing going on in your brain for other things. Um, it's good to take multiple readings and then take averages across those just to kind of clean and get rid of some of the outliers in the data. So I did that. And then um, I asked um, a bunch of yes, no questions again with, um, with eyes closed, relaxed face. And so they just answered yes or no. And so I had them tell the truth. And then I did another run where they lie and that sort of thing. And so here are some of the questions that I asked in the initial uh, set with my husband. Um, is your name Eric Marsman? Were you born in 1978? Um, so some, some of these are true and some of these are false. So some of them, the correct answer is yes, and for some of them, the correct answer is no. And I did that on purpose intentionally um, in order to create a nice confusion matrix of, um, of I wanted there to be you know, true, false, yes, no, um, things in each of those quadrants, essentially. And so, like for example, no, we don't have a dog. No, he doesn't have red hair. Um, yes, he has a PhD. Yes, he's married. Um, no, uh, we don't have five children. Or actually, we don't have five children. He might have five children, but if he does, then we have another problem. Um, so, uh, just the, so I, I kind of just did all these things that had very, very hopefully very clear yes or no uh, question, answers, and then uh, was able to um, use that data. All right, so that was kind of the, the procedure. Here is some documentation of uh, that first fateful run. I wanted to have it well documented. So, oh, cool, can I take a picture so I can maybe put this on my blog sometime? And he's like, fine. So you can tell he's really excited to help me with this research. Uh, <laughs> no, Jennifer, I don't have an Ashley Madison account. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> I'll decide when we're done, honey. 
Um, all right, and then the next thing you see is uh, sensor quality. So I mentioned that that was an enumeration. And uh, th there's the kind of the enumeration what they map to. And I, I grabbed two different screenshots of what this looks like. And actually, I was uh, running last night, and um, I actually hadn't used this headset in a while. So like the sensor pads had gotten really, really dry. So I had to dump like most of a bottle of this on it to get them reading nicely again. But um, when they haven't, when they when they dry out, they they tend to go. They're they're black essentially. They don't uh, read well at all. And then you have to get them really wet to to work well. Um, but that gives you a sense. So zero or the black is is like almost no signal at all. And then there's um, green is the, the strongest level of signal. And then there's kind of progressive levels of degradation in the quality of the signal that are available. And as you saw in that Excel spreadsheet, all of that data comes through individually for each one of the, the nodes on my head. All right, now here's a mapping of what those column names actually map to. So you guys saw some crazy things like the you know, AF3, which actually is this guy right here. Yeah, so again, this is a heads up um, display. So you're looking down, that thing on top is my nose and these are my ears. So essentially you're looking at it like this, right? <laughs> is the, the view that you're seeing. And so the um, T8 and T7 are the ones right above my ears. These in ones in the back of the head are the um, O1 and O2. So um, that's kind of where it, where it all maps. So it's kind of interesting if you want to go back and see, okay, what, what part of your mind is actually lighting up at various things, you can go back and do that. All right, then the next thing is around, um, so I, I did do some research because a lot of times when you have what you think is a really good idea, um, someone has done it before, right? Somebody's at least thought about it. And so I wanted to see, you know, this doesn't seem like, I mean, I, th I thought it was a really cool idea, but it's pr I'm probably not the first person to have thought of it, right? And so I went out to do some research to see what had other people done, had anyone done anything before with EEG and um, lie detection. And so I found something, uh, this, this, some research here on something called the P300 ERP. So ERP stands for event-related potential. That's actually a way of processing EEG um, in a way that kind of does some of that like smoothing out for you, uh, essentially. Um, but what it does is it actually measures um, uh, not uh, so so th this works a little differently. So the, the P300 ERP is a little dip. It's actually this dip that you see right here in, in this waveform. So this little whoop, this, this deep dip right here is the P300 ERP. And they call it the P300 because it occurs roughly 300 milliseconds after you see a visual uh, stimuli. And what, what the stimuli that you see is essentially that, that feeling of recognition. Okay, so imagine you're walking through NDC London and you know, you're, there's all these faces coming by you and then all of a sudden you go, you have that, oh, I know that person from somewhere and maybe you've seen them at a user group before or something like that, but it's not someone that you know very well, but you still kind of get that flash of, oh, I've seen that face before, right? Have everybody's experienced this feeling, right? That's the P300 ERP. So it's, it's, a, um, it's a subconscious thing. Your brain just does it. It's, it's your brain pattern matching essentially. So it gives you that, whoop, that little dip that you see. And so the way, P, uh, government agencies and such have, have been using this data is they've been experimenting with using that in conjunction with detecting guilt. So the idea is instead of hooking someone to a polygraph and asking them yes, no questions, um, you actually do more of a visual examination where you can throw up images in front of them and then see how they respond to the image. Do, does that recognition flash? So for example, you might put up a couple of neutral images and then maybe you know, a picture of this, the crime scene you know, or uh, the murder weapon or something like that. And if they have that, that flash of recognition, that's something that's a lot harder to, to fool right, than a... Um, than a, than a polygraph where you can kind of control your breathing rate and things like that. But that, that flash of recognition is harder to suppress. Okay, does that kind of make sense? All right, and then obviously this is a really fancy way of saying if the person uh, <laughs> knows something that, they, that only a guilty person would know, then they might be guilty, right? They might have some knowledge that they're not being completely straightforward with. All right? So that is the, the P300 ERP. So it's interesting, interesting stuff. All right, so now let me transition. That was some of my research and the experiment procedure and such. So now let's talk about you know, how I process the data. So I was using um, Azure Machine Learning. Um, I, I work for Microsoft and Azure ML is a really nice tool for doing 
almost like rapid, rapid, or rapid development of, um, of machine learning tools. Uh, it's, it's, it's really neat because there's, there's these 25 different machine learning algorithms that are already baked in there, and you can just kind of drag and drop and wire up a workflow like really, really quickly. And um, you can swap in and out algorithms really fast. And so it's kind of a neat, a neat tool for, um, for doing these things. And there's also, if any of you guys are data scientists, um, there's ways to drag and drop in modules with Python scripts in them and R as well. So you can take little chunks of R and little chunks of Python, run them right from within, Azure Machine Learning. You can also use SQL, which is handy. I've used that to do like group buys to um, compress my data or um, aggregate my data. Um, so very, very, very cool stuff, very powerful stuff. So it contains all these modules for importing and doing various kinds of data cleaning and such. And then you can create experiments, train your models, test your models. And then really the, the most exciting thing that I know this is not like sexy at all, but the most exciting thing is uh, the deployment is just beautiful because it's literally a button press and then it exposes kind of your trained model on a REST endpoint for you. It sets up the security, it gives you a, an API key, so only people with the API key have, you know, can call the model. So like all of that's taken care of for you. And then um, you can just call this model with this API key and then they give you sample code to do it. It's just really, really, really beautiful. Um, and simple, so very, very nice, uh, very, very nice deployment story, is is fabulous. All right, so let me just talk really briefly about. Okay, so I have this problem I want to solve. How how might I do that? And here's one way to do uh, to solve a supervised learning uh, problem. So um, supervised learning you would use when you have historical data and you want to make predictions about future data. And so um, the first thing you'd need to do, like in, in Azure Machine Learning, when you, you'd need to wire up something that, that could look like this. And so the first thing that we have or we, is we need to get our data set in there. And there's several different ways of getting data into Azure Machine Learning. Um, you can import data from, or you can upload it locally from if you have data on your machine like I did, you can just upload it um, uh, as a new data set. Or you can stream data from elsewhere on the internet. There's like an OData feed provider, as well as accessing stuff from, from Azure is fairly easy and, and a lot of other things. So we, we pull in all this data so, um, in various ways. And then you can apply various data cleaning modules. So there's a whole bunch of different data cleaning modules to do things with like data with missing values. How do you want to handle those? Um, doing filtering and other various cleanup, doing things like getting rid of the data with um, bad signal quality, right? If you saw those zeros and some of the contact quality, throwing that data out, all of those types of things, pulling out, splicing out the um, everything between the one and two, you could use a little script to do that. So all kinds of good stuff. Then, after your data was clean and in a format that was easy to use, uh, you'd want to split your data. And the reason uh, we do this in supervised machine learning problems is that when you have this labeled data set, you have a whole bunch of data with like essentially the right answers, right? Like for example, let me, let me take it away from EEG and something a little bit more concrete, but I like to give the example of um, predicting the, the price of a home. So you would have a whole bunch of features of things that would affect the price of a home and then how much that house actually cost, right? So your features or the things that would, would influence that prediction could be things like you know, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, um, size of the home, square footage or, or whatever, um, the, uh, the number of years since the kitchen's kitchen's been remodeled, the size of the master bathroom, because for some reason people really care about having a big master bath in the U.S. at least. So very, you know, various things that people might care about, size of the yard, whatever. So a lot of different features like that. And then we have the, the price. And so if I said, you know, for a house that is, you know, 3,000 square feet, um, location might also be relevant to you. So maybe in this neighborhood or something like that, um, the cost of the home is, you know, uh, $300,000, let's say. If that were the case, and I, I fed it all that data, and then I wanted to test how well it did, and I said, okay, tell me how much a 3,000 square foot home in this particular area would be, of course it's gonna give me the right answer, right? Because that's the data that I trained it on. So it already knows that right answer. So what we do when we have this labeled data set is we actually hold back some of the data. So you only train it with maybe, you know, uh, 70, 75, 80% of the data and then you hold back, you know, 25%-ish, 
and then um, use that to test the model. So that way it's seeing data that it's never seen before, and then you can compare the output that the model created with what the actual known right answer is, and you can see how well it actually did. Does that make sense, kind of? Am I explaining that well enough? Okay. So in this case, what we're doing here is we're splitting the data. And in my case, for my experiment, I think I did a 70-30 split. So I trained um, with this EEG data. I trained it on 70% of the data. So that means 70% of the data went here as training data. And then with Azure Machine Learning, you just tell it which algorithm you want to do. And that basically tells it which type of math do I want to apply um, to find the correlations between those features and that you know, label that you want to predict, okay? So there's different types of math, and they're all good at different things. All right, so you, you tell it which algorithm, and then I then apply that math to figure out that data, and that, that trains our model. And then it builds a model based on that, based on those patterns. And then what I do is I take that trained model, that gets fed into the score model module, and then I also pass in that, that um, in my case, 30% of data that I held back. And then what score model does is it actually feeds in the features. So it feeds in kind of those inputs, if you will, and says, OK, you know, for this trained model, what do you think? And then the model produces its answers. And then you compare it against the actual right answer that you, that you already knew. OK? Does that make sense? So that happens here. And then that will give the model a score for how well the model, how accurate and, and other various features the model, the model is. And then those all get passed to evaluate module. And then what you can do with the evaluate module is actually do a whole nother model over here. So maybe I build the same thing over on this side, only I use a different algorithm. So let me try this algorithm versus that algorithm, see which one performs better. Or maybe on the other side, maybe I, I've settled on an algorithm, but I'm going to use different initial parameters to my algorithm, because you actually need to do some, some messing with a lot of the initial parameters to um, affect the, the accuracy of your, your algorithms as well. OK? So then I can just keep trying. This is a little bit of the, the, the art of data science. It's not all science. Sometimes there's a little bit of, let's try this, let's try this. Um, so you, you do that, and so I, I try a couple different things, and then you can use that evaluate model, and it'll compare two against each other to see how they perform against each other. All right? So that's essentially what you can do, or one template to use for supervised learning um, in Azure ML. So the one remaining question, so that, that might kind of make sense. Does that kind of make sense to folks? OK. The one thing that might not make sense is, OK, John, you said that there are these 25 different algorithms in Azure Machine Learning. If I don't have a machine learning background, how do I know which algorithm to pick? All right, so how do I know which algorithm to stick right here? Enter the Azure Machine Learning cheat sheet, cheat sheet, cheat sheet, cheat sheet, right? OK, so this is a, um, a wonderful resource uh, that um, this lovely data scientist, um, Brandon, on the Azure ML uh, team put together. And it is a, um, it's kind of uh, based on you, you start with the large, friendly start node. And then first, you kind of break down what problem are you trying to solve with this. And so there is um, the problem of uh, if you just have, you want to find structure in your data and, and group similar things together, you might want to use a clustering algorithm. And so we have a k-means clustering algorithm, which is the most popular type of clustering algorithm um, available. And then we also have, um, if you want to do uh, make predictions, so that supervised learning that we were talking about, there's kind of two different categories of predictions. You can predict categories versus values. So the difference between those is um, if I wanted to predict the price of a home, like I was talking about before, that's a number, right? That's a value on a continuum. And so for, for numbers like that, we are actually, uh, that's what's called a regression problem. And that's handled a little bit differently because it's, um, they're, they're actually numbers. So you can do things like, you know, extrapolate between values. Like I might have a, um, in my training set, I may have a, uh, you know, a home that cost you know, $200,000 and a home that cost $300,000. And it could extrapolate or uh, figure out from that that another home might cost you know, $250,000, even though that value wasn't in my training set. Right? It can figure out those values on a continuum. Um, and then there's also the idea of predicting categories. So categories is when uh, the things that you're trying to predict fit into distinct buckets, right? Different buckets, different categories. So um, is, this, um, is this person going to develop breast cancer in the next you know, uh, 
three years, yes or no? Um, is um, who is going to win, you know, Michigan or Michigan State? Um, who is the, you know, um, am I going to go over or under my sales quota? Boom, boom. So, and it doesn't have to be binary either. It could be multiple things. Like, which color is this based on these uh, series of pixels? Um, red, yellow, or blue? Those types of things. All right. So all of the, those, that's what's called a classification problem, all right? So you can do, do it like that. And then finally, we also have something in here called anomaly detection. So anomaly detection is really useful when your data set is highly unbalanced. So think about the problem of like credit card fraud detection, right? Um, in, in that particular scenario, you have, uh, if I'm you know, a large credit card company, I probably have a huge database of transactions and the majority of them are hopefully you know, valid transactions, but then there is going to be some small percentage of them that are fraudulent, but then there's probably an even smaller percentage that is a known fraudulent transaction. So the known fraudulent transactions versus the entirety of your data set is going to be very, um, you know, hopefully a very, very small percentage of the entire thing. And so when you're trying to train a data set to predict between the two of those, that's actually really hard when you only have a, you know, a couple examples, a relatively small number of examples of, of one side, and then a whole bunch of examples of the other side, if I was trying to predict valid or fraudulent. Right? And so an anomaly detection can handle things like this. So it can say, OK, this is kind of within the basis of normal, and then this is outside of normal. So um, when you have a highly unbalanced data set like that, it's, it's great. So credit card fraud detection, um, um, anomalies in like pipeline flow of, you know, here's oil flowing through pipelines to be delivered. And, and if things are off there, uh, um, if people are siphoning off oil and gas or things like that, those could detect it, those kinds of things. Um, uh, network uh, hacking intrusion can use anomaly detection. So a lot of cool things like that, uh, you'd use anomaly detection. All right, so in my particular case, I was trying to use EEG, a bunch of brainwave data, uh, to predict um, whether or not my husband was lying. So where would I go here? So I'm on the start thing. Do I want to discover structure, find unusual data points, predict values, or predict categories? Anybody know? I know it's really early in the morning. What's that? Categories, 10 points to Gryffindor. Yes, we are trying to predict categories. And now if I predict categories, am I doing three or more, or am I doing two? Two, yes, I was making it binary. I did not ask any questions like, does this dress make me look fat? Where there might actually be an in-betweeny type answer. Um, so yes, there were two. Everything was either true or false. So in this case, that would take me to this two-class classification. And then it tells you then all of these things that are um, kind of where each, each algorithm really shines. Like for example, support vector machines. SVMs are really good if you have a lot of features. Um, there are some linear ones, and they're great because they're really fast but they only work if your data is linear. Um, there's some decision forests and uh, various ensembles of decision trees. And so here's um, kind of where each one is good. Boosted decision trees are great, but they have a large memory footprint, um, those kind of things. So there's a lot of great uh, things. So you can kind of look at that and be like, okay, let me try a couple different things. I usually start with a linear and a nonlinear one just to see what accommodates my, my data best. Um, so you can, you can mess around with these, but then, again, it's really easy to swap things in and out um, as you try out and experiment with these. All right, and then if you do want to download this yourself, you can download a nice copy and like print it out and like hang it in your office and look super cool. Um, it's aka.ms WAC Azure, um, Azure Machine Learning Cheat Sheet. And then I also have some resources up there. Um, I wrote a blog post on kind of how to get started with Azure Machine Learning. I actually wrote it for a student audience, so you'll have to forgive me because it is uh, like the title of the, blog, the article is, you know, how to win a hackathon with Azure Machine Learning because it was for students. But just skip like the first paragraph and then the rest of it is really like how to get started with Azure Machine Learning. And that's um, aka.mswack hackml. And then I do have a video end-to-end -end walkthrough of building and training and deploying um, a, a model in Azure ML, and that is um, using the Titanic data set. So it's all this demographic information about passengers on the Titanic, on the ship, and then um, using that data to predict whether or not they survive or tragically perish. Um, so that is a, another kind of good example, and it's like two like 20 minute long video, so it's not that long. So feel free to check any of those out if you'd like more info.
Okay, so let's see, let me show you, after I put this in Azure Machine Learning, let's see, so I'm gonna show you a very early prototype that I put together. Um, and so what I did was um, I followed basically that, that model that you saw before. There's other ways you can do this too, um, rather than the 30, um, 30, 70 split, there's um, uh, other, other methods, um, but that's one way that can work. So what I did was follow um, something similar to that, and then I, I, here's my evaluate model. And what's really cool about this is it gives you a lot of data around how these two compare. So in this case, I think, um, I think I was using the same data, but I was using two different algorithms. I believe this one was a linear model, so I think this was maybe a logistic regression, is this one? And this one was a um, decision jungle. Decision jungles are awesome. All right, so if you look at this, you can see that there's a, a let me, actually, let me show you how to read this chart too first. So first of all, what this, this chart is measuring is your true positive rate versus your false positive rate. So um, what that means is true positives are when we think it's true and it actually is true. Um, false positives are when we think it's true and it actually is not true. So that's not good either. So um, basically, you want zero false positives, which would mean I would want this to go all the way, I would want this curve to go all the way up to here, and then you want 100% true positive. So, do, do, do. so perfect would be this curve or this line going all the way up to here and then hugging all the way across there, right? Um, so you want your curve to hug this as much as possible. Um, and you can see this one and this right here, this kind of, you can never see it on a projector, but essentially imagine a gray line kind of going across the diagonal of this square. Um, that's essentially 50-50 random chance monkey flipping a coin, right? So if your curve is not higher than the diagonal, then maybe start over. <laughs> maybe there's something wrong. Um, so in this case, if I look at this, this first one, this one seems like it's doing maybe 75% you know, or something because it's kind of right in the middle. And if you look at this, the accuracy is about 71%. So eh, whatevs. Um, but if I look at this one, so this is my decision jungle right here. Um, this one actually is hugging that curve pretty well. So I, I again, this was um, early stuff. So this, I, I don't think this was actually doing, what this was doing was just telling, could, could I differentiate between my lying data and my, my truth data? And you can see right here that I do have, um, my, my true positives are high, you want those to be high, and your true negatives are high, and you want those to be high, so that's good. And then false positives and false negatives are both low, which is good, you want those both to be low. And you can see I have an accuracy of about 93%, um, which is very good. And then the precision numbers and the recall numbers are fairly high too, and then F1 is actually a combination of precision and recall. And then this um, AUC that stands for area under the curve, which is kind of like what you saw there, is about 98%. So that's very, very high. Um, so that was, I was starting to think, okay, maybe there's something to this. Like maybe I could actually do this thing. Um, and there's actually some a great data down here as well that's um, bidding of, okay, let me, let me kind of sort these things into different bins. And it gives you information on that too. So a lot of good data that you can get from here. So I saw that there was some, uh, some idea, this was looking kind of positive that, oh my goodness, 93% accuracy, that's um, fairly good. So let's, so the next thing I did was, um, it was really funny because I, I just gotten some of these early results and then literally um, the week, maybe two weeks, two or, two or three weeks later, um, but like very close after this, um, my team had an offsite. So I work on a distributed team we all live in, in different areas. And so my, um, you know, my, my manager actually sits in like Minneapolis and I sit in Michigan and there's other people just all spread out all over the US. And so we all get together once or twice a year for like, you know, talk about priorities and blah, blah, blah and that sort of thing. And so, and then last year when we all got together for this, um, we actually had a metric that year where we all had to deliver like X number of Channel 9 videos. Does anyone watch Channel 9? Microsoft's online free videos, cool, you should check them out if you don't watch them. Um, so we had a metric where we all had to produce, you know, X number of channel nine videos and stuff. And so to help us out, like while we were all on site together, our marketing team actually brought a camera crew. So there was this professional quality like camera crew um, sitting around. And so I was like, oh, I have an idea. So I grabbed my manager and I grabbed the cameraman and I'm like, I'll 
would it be okay if I uh, asked you some questions and recorded it just to see what would happen? And he was like, sure. I, I'm like, this is for my research that I'm doing with that EEG thing. And he's like, oh yeah, what are you doing with that? Okay, sure, let's check it out. So this is what happened. <laughs> First, I wanted to get an accurate uh, sense for my manager's data to be able to calibrate it specifically for my manager. So I did the same thing that I did to my husband, where first I asked him a series of questions to get a baseline for what his brain uh, thought was the truth. So here we go. Are you a female? No. Are you a male? Yes. Have you ever worked for Microsoft? Yes. Okay, you guys get the idea, right? All right, and then I asked him to lie to me. Do you have a PhD? Yes. Do you currently have a pet? Yes. No. Do you have blue eyes? Yes. No, 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 no. Okay, so that's a bunch of lying. Now, what would you guys do if you had access to your manager's brainwaves? <laughs> Here we go. Do you believe Microsoft is the best company in the world to work for? Yes. Am I going to get a promotion this year? Yes. <laughs> Um, so you guys all heard that totally awkward little giggle, right? <laughs> so of course I was like, what does that mean? Does that mean that things are going well and he has some good news that he can't tell me yet? Or does that mean that like I totally suck and he doesn't know like how to tell me? So, so of course I did what any girl would do and immediately ran back to my hotel room and built a classifier with his brainwaves. So let's um, take a look at what happened. I also built um, a really um, ugly Windows 10 app because I am not a UI design person. Yeah, check that out. I stole a control from somewhere and stuck it in there. And yeah, so I will put it on GitHub one of these days and then just like make a plea of like, somebody could you redesign this for me and make it actually look nice. But um, UI has never been my strong point. <laughs> Okay, so um, here, just to refresh you, the questions were, do you believe Microsoft is the best company in the world to work for? Um, my manager said yes, and my algorithm that I built, so what I actually did was I went into Azure Machine Learning, used a similar model, basically took the one that I built for my husband, then re-jiggered it um, with, to put just my manager's data in it, so his training and his desk data, so that this would be a model calibrated specific to his, my manager's brain, and then, um, uh, published it, so tested it, trained it, you know, did a couple different things to make it, um, uh, tuned it, um, and then published it. And then um, this is so exposed on an endpoint, and then this Windows 10 app actually calls that endpoint and then gets data back from it. So, do you believe Microsoft is the best company in the world for? He said yes. My algorithm says that. Oh, no. He has an iPhone. And he's really into design. I'm just saying, we might have a closeted uh, Apple fanboy. Okay, so then um, the next question, the really important one, am I gonna get a promotion this year? My algorithm says, yeah, truth, yes. And I am actually uh, delighted to announce that as of uh, September, um, I did get the promotion, yeah. So it was in fact accurate. So very, very good stuff. Um, really cool. So that's just one example of um, calling an, a machine learning service. Ah, no, not you. Sorry about that. Okay, shift of five. There we go. All right, so um, I have done a bunch of modifications since then. You're not going to read all this, so let me just call out some of the, the salient points. Um, I've done a, some of the changes I've done since that first run with my husband and this early stuff are, first of all, I put mul multiple markers in the data. So before, I think I was sending, like on the very first run, I think I only put one marker in the data, which was after I stopped asking the question and when he started answering, and then I was grabbing like a time around that. And so I actually started doing, sending one at the beginning and one at the end to be able to grab, pull out all that data accurately and then uh, mess with it within there. Um, I started taking neutral brain state recordings. I didn't have a neutral state when I first ran the experiment, and I think that helps a lot, because remember when I was, you, you know, every, every brain has their own digital, or not digital, but everyone has their own electrochemical sig uh, signature. And so um, 
When you think about like when, when we were training the, the cube to move with my mind, it actually used that neutral state to calibrate it across people. So as I'm trying to build something right now that will work general purpose across all people, um, having that neutral brain state recording will help with, uh, with a kind of data normalization, essentially. I, I added more questions because my very first question list was a very short list, so I, I expanded that out. Um, oh, this is kind of interesting. So um, as I took data from a bunch of people, one of the things that we thought about was that if, when, when I first put the headset on you and you're like answering questions, you're like, yeah, there's this crazy lady asking me questions and I'm wearing a brainwave thing and this is kind of cool. But then after you've been answering questions for a while, it starts to get boring, okay? And so the problem was I didn't want, if I, I, I was asking everybody truth and then lie, and I didn't want like that excitement and this is cool all to get kind of, put into that truth data, and then everybody was starting to check out by the time they got to lie, because then it might inaccurately start to pick up on like that emotional state rather than whether it's, it was truth or lie, right? So what I did to account for that was for some people, I asked them to lie first, and then I asked them to tell me the truth, and then for others, I asked them to tell me the truth and then lie. So that should cancel out those, that, that fatigue effect of getting sick of answering the questions. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, I ask additional data about the test subject as well. So I was asking things like someone suggested this and I just collected the data because I always have more data. There's no, nothing wrong with too much data. Uh, so um, I was asking about um, whether someone was right or left-handed because you know how um, uh, whether you're right or left-handed is supposed to correlate to the dominant side of your brain. So I was like, okay, let me just at least collect that data and I can use it if I want to. So I started uh, gathering a little bit of additional data about the test subject. Um, and then their age and a few other things. And then I also started mixing truth and lie in a single session as well to try to tease out any confounding variables. All right, I added more questions in here. So there's a little bit more questions uh, in here. This, here's some of the additional data that I'm collecting, the um, gender, the age, right or left-handed. Um, here are some of the different ways that I was doing uh, feature extraction, so how to figure out what are the relevant things in, all, in that EEG data. Um, one way to do it is unrolling the waveform, where essentially with time series data, you take the first thing and then kind of this. So I have the first set of um, measurements, and then I take the second ones and put it right next to it and next to it and whatever. And it works as long as you can get a consistent like start point um, every time. But that was kind of sketchy. Uh, wavelets is another really big thing. So there was actually an EEG competition on the Kaggle website, which is this data science competition website. And uh, one of the, the most uh, leading variables that the winners found was these um, low frequency time domain signals was actually the most telling variable. And so um, I, I was trying some stuff with that too. Um, I also found a Pi EEG library online. Thank you, Forrest Chang Bao, uh, who, who wrote it. So I, he was actually extracting interesting information out of um, EEG signals. So I leveraged that and started pulling some of the stuff that he had out of there. Um, the other thing I was thinking about is like a, a hidden Markov model or like a little mini state machine. So when you think about it, when, when you're actually going through the process of lying, there's, there's a lot of stuff happening in your brain, right? Like first you're listening to the question, you're thinking about the answer, you're thinking about whether you want to tell the truth or lie, then you come up with your answer, and then you have to do the mental activity to actually vocalize your answer and say it out loud. So there's a, a bunch of kind of things that happen in a row. So it's almost like a little state machine. So if you can kind of zero in on the, the most relevant uh, parts of the state machine, that might make it useful. Um, I already talked about comparing to a neutral brain state. Um, using ERP instead of raw EEG is another thing I've been kind of playing around with. Um, ensembles is another thing. So that's a technique in machine learning where essentially you can combine multiple, um, multiple classifiers together to get an even more powerful result. And then finally, um, deep learning. So I think this is a problem that essentially screams for deep learning. Um, and the reason is it's very similar to the idea of um, speech recognition, right? Because we all have our own unique voices, our own unique pitch and timber and all the other things that are related to, to voice or vocalization. And if you guys have, I'm sure everybody has seen a, you know, a speech you know, waveform as you're talking, it's, it's it looks like that. If you've done any kind of video processing, you can see that your, your voice uh, signals sound very similar. And so being able to um, extract, you know, very similar people saying the same thing with different accents and different, um, different voices, uh, but still f see that that's the same word, it's essentially the same thing as what I'm doing here, is trying to find out truth or lie with different uh, brain signatures. 
And so I think, and, and essentially the, the speech uh, recognition problem has been solved with deep learning. So I really, I believe t deep learning could see solve this as well. The only reason I haven't done it yet is I don't have enough data. You need a lot of data to do uh, deep learning accurately. And I just don't, I've been doing this as kind of a side project. So um, I just don't have the, the quantity of data yet to make that truly effective. All right, next steps, I've been gathering data from a lot of people to try to do something general purpose, um, experimenting like you saw on the previous slide with a bunch of different things. And then um, the last thing, this I don't think is actually that hard to do, but um, having a real-time feedback loop so you can actually put it on someone's head and ask the questions in real time and then get some responses. So. Very, very cool stuff there. A bunch of thank yous to a lot of people. I kind of was showing this early work to the Azure Machine Learning team, and they were all like really excited about it, and a bunch of people offered a bunch of really helpful suggestions that have made the work even better, so I'm grateful to them. And then finally, this headset is so cool. Like it's, it's awesome, and it's not that expensive, and it's so much fun. Uh, and I have all these other ideas of how I want to use um, EEG in conjunction with machine learning to do other cool things. Um, Microsoft Azure Machine Learning is really, really a powerful tool. Like you can, you can uh, get started and get up and running and do some, some pretty powerful stuff, uh, and it's, it's just amazing. It makes it very simple and very easy. And then finally, husbands and managers, beware. <laughs> Mind control is next. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>